Well, good morning, and welcome to Oak Ridge Community Church. My name's Tom Noblet, and let's give a big round of applause for Obel, Oak Ridge Online, everybody that's watching online. And I wanted to introduce you to one of my favorite families on the planet Earth, which is the entire universe, and this is Anthony and Kristen Buss, and it, <laughs> we have other fans, I guess, as well. But, you know, we're in this campaign called Be Rich, and Be Rich is during the whole month of November, and it's where I ask you and everybody in your family to pitch in 40 bucks. And for that 40 bucks, there's 18 ministries that we support over the course of the year to the tune of over $100,000. So we're asking you guys to pitch in just uh, a portion of this, and then you can celebrate, you can be part of all this. So if you see something that's going on at one of the ministries where they're feeding people, that's you. You're doing that. If you see... So we thought we'd bring up a new ministry that we get to support this year, and we had thought about uh, two people that brought it to my attention, and they can tell you a little bit about uh, the, the name of the ministry and the ministry. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so yeah, good morning, everybody. We're the Bus family, and we want to talk to you a little bit this morning about the New Hope Foundation. Uh, very briefly, New Hope Foundation is a group of Western people, uh, U.S. people, people that live in England, uh, that are located in China, and they operate Hi, baby. <laughs> they operate uh, care centers in uh, local child welfare homes. So they go in, they partner with the local community, and they provide everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Uh, food, clothing, uh, medical care. And that's, that's really where the greatest need is. Um, they care for the most medically fragile children in all of these communities. Um, some have no family. Some have no other uh, people to care for them. Uh, they sponsored two surgeries for our girls. We're direct benefits of the work that they're doing, life-saving surgery. They came in, they were malnourished, didn't have what they needed, hadn't been fed. Um, this is what they do. They, they provide uh, treatment. They provide, again, love, nurturing, and it's all done in the name of Jesus. So with that said, we have a short video that will just feature some of the work New Hope does, and we thank you for watching and for your support of the Be Rich campaign. So that's a quick look at New Hope. If you have any questions, if you, we're, we would love to talk to you. As, just stop us in the hallway, and thank you again for the opportunity you, to talk Anthony about it. They put their faith into action. They've adopted two children. Uh, you can be part of this. Jesus says, whatever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. So seriously, here's the deal. If you want to know you're helping orphaned kids in China, pull out your checkbook, pull out your charge card, fill out a Be Rich campaign, and 100% of everything that we collect during the month of November goes to these type of organizations. Father, we just praise you. We thank you that we can be the light and we can be the salt of the world. We can be the people that are generous. We can be the people that spread hope. We can be the people that bring joy to people's lives. We can tur turn dark clouds into brighter clouds. Father, we thank you. We thank you for all you do. We thank you for the church, the bride of Christ. We thank you for these people that live out a life that uh, would be in direct honor of Jesus. Father, we praise you for that. We praise you for families and people that love one another well. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. With that said, I want you to stand, and we're going to read what's coming on the screen together, and then we're going to go into God in song. So read your outdoor voice. Here's your outdoor voice. Here's your indoor voice. I am first. Here's your outdoor voice. I am first. Okay, ready? Outdoor voice. Together, ready? I am first. I am first who you say I am. You say I am the treasured child of the Most High God. I am the treasured child of the Most High God. Let's sing.
guys can go and take a seat. Great morning. We have got four baptisms scheduled this morning. So two in this service and two in the next one. So why don't you give it up for Michael and Denise Cook, husband and wife up here coming. And so pretty cool. There's a lot of people up here, isn't there? Yeah. Not trying to make you nervous or anything, but there's a whole lot of people you're standing in front of, isn't there? Yeah, this is good. So, you know, there's a, a, there's a, in the scriptures, it's just a pattern. It's pretty clear. You read through the book of Acts where the church was starting and the gospel would be preached, the good news of Jesus Christ. People would respond, they would believe, and the next step was they would be baptized. They would step forth in obedience and, and clothe themselves with Christ. There's great symbolism. They're identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, saying that we are dead, and, and, you know, dead to ourselves and alive in Christ. So just an amazing thing. There's a passage of Scripture in Galatians 3 that the Apostle Paul wrote, and it says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So Michael is going to come up first and just you can just step right up here. He's going to share a little bit of, of his story and then his wife is going to follow in that. All right. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, there really are a whole lot of you now that I'm standing up here. All right, here we go. When I first walked into this church several years ago, I reluctantly came in and sat down. I look, looked around and took in the whole scene. And my first thought was, why do they have a miniature hot tub? I was skeptical, full of ignorance and intolerance. I was ready to write it off, looking for any reason to be offended. I expected to find what I had found in church before, which was fear and judgment. However, this was not what I found here. I found welcoming people in an attitude of compassion and forgiveness. I sought God when I was younger, but wasn't ready to hear the message. In the years to come, I became very lost. My life was filled with sin and deceit. At one point, I believed God did not even exist as my problems continued to mount. I wanted to believe, but I could not see past the disaster I had made of my life. I thought God was there for better people. I thought Christ was for those who were honest, decent, and worthy. Now I see that Christ is for people just like me. When my life hit the darkest point and I thought that I could not go on, I asked God for help because someone told me to and I was out of ideas. I had no expectation that anything would change, but I asked and God answered. I have been nothing but blessed since then. As life got better, I became stale in my resolve. I became ungrateful and bitter and sometimes mean. When Oak Bridge opened back up after COVID, I followed my wife here because she told me we could get lunch on the way home, and I figured, <laughs> I figured it was worth it. We started coming every week, and the more we came, I started to understand what was being said. I started hearing verses that struck me to the core. At every turn, I have been welcomed and feel that I'm becoming part of a church family, which is something I never even knew I wanted. I have to thank everyone here for making this such a special and unique place. Mostly, I want to thank my beautiful and wonderful wife, Denise, because if it were not for her example of what faith can do for a person, I would not be standing here. I'm taking this step today because I no longer want a part-time relationship with God. I'm ready to live with God in every part of my life. Thank you. It's hard to follow my husband, the comedian, who also made me cry. <laughs> uh, my name's Denise. Um, there was never a time in my life that I did not know of God and Jesus. I was um, raised in a church. I went to a faith-based school. I was active in my church youth group. My whole family um, believed in, in the same faith and I just never questioned it. I started questioning um, when my mom had a brain aneurysm in my early 20s. She survived. She underwent three brain surgeries and she was never the woman, the mom that I had known again. I was also never someone that she never truly knew or remembered again. In three years time, she died of cancer, a cancer that we didn't know she, would ha she had until it was too late. We didn't recognize the symptoms um, with this personality of hers. Um, the day of her funeral is the day I most clearly remember questioning God. Why? Why, why, why? And so many people approached me that day not knowing I was struggling internally with this. And they told me that we don't know why God does things, that sometimes terrible things happen to good people, 
The message I received that day confirmed my doubts that God did this, and I'll never know why. It's just done. I wasn't equipped with the tools to handle this. I didn't have the faith I needed to endure this. To say that I resented God would be an understatement. I intentionally forced him out of my life, and I found my relief in alcohol instead. Oblivion was so much better than the pain and the complete emotional and spiritual bankruptcy. A tricky little thing that the devil does, he speaks to us in our own voices sometimes. And I told myself that I could control it, that I didn't matter to anyone anyway, that people would be better off without me. I was restless, angry, and unhappy all of the time. There was no peace in my life, and I kept existing in this miserable state. Eventually, even I was sick of me, and I was encouraged and agreed to get some help. I met, I met a woman not long after, and I told her that I was an atheist. She challenged me by asking how I could be so angry at a God I didn't believe in. And it took me a while, but she was right. Uh, I just didn't know it. He'd been there all along. He held my hand when I cried. He made sure I was safe through all my wreckage. He placed the right people in my life who could have easily abandoned me. I listened to Joy FM, and there's a, a my story in 99 seconds that said that... Um, that God didn't take away a person who had died. He received her. And I can't explain what that moment was like when I heard that and understood. He received my mom and he took her suffering away. My soul is finally at peace with that. The same friend, uh, I call her my sister now, that challenged my disbelief, invited me and my family to Oak Bridge and she's here to baptize me today. <laughs> Here at Oak Bridge, we have found a home, a family. I've learned what Jesus' death and resurrection really mean for me. I'm humbled by his grace. He has always had a plan and a purpose for me. All of my experiences were to prepare me to do valuable work for him. If you are struggling with addiction, please know that you are not alone and you are worthy. There is hope. In closing, I would like to read a passage from Psalms. 116. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious, gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Tom, no offense, but you don't really need to preach today, I don't no, think. No, we're done. So. As Michael's coming in, I just want you guys, most of you know this already, but, but what we're talking about today, this is church. Let's go forward a little bit. The stories you hear are real. The God that they trust is true. The Jesus that they uh, identify with is our Savior. He is our leader. Michael, upon your confession of faith that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior, you're now baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
I'm going to pray. Father in heaven, just um, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for transformation, for life. Thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for t- these two and the testimony and the encouragement that they gave the rest of the body of Christ. And I thank you for this place and for people all over the world who have made Christ their Savior and, and, and live for other people and live for your glory, Father. Thank you for the influence uh, that people have being salt and light. And just uh, thank you, God, for your goodness and, and faithfulness and all this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is Titus 3, 4, 4 3, verse, chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. We serve a big God, don't we? You know, the words of the song, we could all come up here and tell our stories about things we're not proud of. And the words of the song are perfect for today. So if you guys would just listen and worship with us.
wasn't based on what I've done. By his goodness and mercy, the power of the blood, his goodness and mercy, the power of when people come, share their stories, tell us the amazing things that you've done in their life, God, the things that you've helped them overcome. God, each one of us could come up here today and tell that same story. God, we just thank you. There are no other words that we can say, but thank you. We lift your name. We give you all the glory, and it is all about Jesus today. We thank you. Everybody said it. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. I've got a couple of announcements for you. Uh, I'm going to go through these really quick because we're a couple minutes behind. But if you're a new guest, don't give. If you're, this is the place you call your home, give. All right? We don't offer communion in here most of the time, but there's a room right behind us that's dedicated to remembering exactly what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. It's called the Reflection Room. You can go through the bookstore. You can either go through these doors and take communion there. There's a place to also pray, so we'd love to offer that to you. November 16th, this is uh, two days from now. Today's the 14th, two days. We start a program called Grief Share. It starts at uh, 6.30. It's in the Care Center. It's surviving the holidays. So some of you know you're going through a time, time of grief right now. You need to speak to somebody. You need to share your lives with some people. We understand that the holidays can be really rough, so I believe it's three weeks that they're going to gather together and go through this program at 6.30 to 8.30. You can sign up online at oakbridgecc.org, uh, or you can just show up if you need to. But uh, we'd love to have you there. So if, if I'm speaking to you, and you know if I'm speaking to you, you need grief, get, go through this, and you'll find it great. Um, I want to show you seven quick photos. We talked about the Be Rich campaign that you get 40 bucks. Here's one of the things we support. This is the largest ministry we support. We feed 150 kids every day, and we educate them as well. So here's seven quick photos to show you of our ministry that's done in Haiti at Oak Bridge, Church, Oak Bridge School in Haiti. Just keep going. These are some of the kids. By the way, stop real quick. We provide all their uniforms. We provide all their books. We pay for all their teachers. We pay for all their food. When I mean we, you give to this, that's you. The girl in the middle looks really happy, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah. She was jacked up to take this photo. There you go. Okay, they're going through a real tough time. I just want to let you know that right now. Their prices have tripled. Okay, so you understand that they now feed the kids half of what they could before because they can only afford so much. I said, well, there might be help on the way depending on the generosity of Oak Bridge Community Church. So we'll see, see what happens there. Um, I want to let you know too as well that Christmas Eve Eve, which we normally have, we're going to do this year Christmas Eve 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 services. That's on December 22nd. We'll have two services, one at 5.30 and one at 7.30, so mark your calendar accordingly. December 26th, we will not have church, and January 2nd, we will not have church. So uh, look at the uh, time periods for that. All right, jump back into Romans. I'm going to give you some good news. Uh, it's 16 chapters. We're at chapter 8. We're midway. Give a round of applause. It is the crown jewel of the Bible. It's the deepest book in the Bible. It's the one that I've studied the most for uh, in my all-the-time preaching. Um, now, here's the bad news. We're in Romans chapter 8, 
And we're going to get through four verses today, and, and this is the bad news. I'm going to spend over six weeks in Romans chapter 8 alone. So I am telling you, we could, it is the richest chapter in the Bible that I'm aware of with things that when, when you read them, you go, I've heard that before. That's powerful. So today I'm going to go into the one that I believe is uh, supremely powerful. It's enormous, the statement that we're going to read today. But for us to understand how enormous the statement is, I think you've got to learn a few things. Now, here's where I want people to clue in and listen up. If you're just trying to figure out who God is, you're trying to figure out who Jesus is, you, you think that you know, God is this, or you think that Jesus is this way, you're glad, we're glad you're here. This church is designed for you. But this message is one if you listen to. You can get an opinion of why I believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. It's why I believe it's the best choice. So now, and if this is a person, if you're in here today and you're already a believer in Christ, this will give you even greater reason to celebrate as we move into the holidays. So it's a win-win for everybody. All right, first question. A justice, justice equals fair treatment. We all believe we deserve justice. Is that not right? So justice is on my mind right now because I see job losses. And when I see job losses, I think, was that a just job loss or is that an unjust job loss? So it's on our people's minds when you hear about it. You think about justice a lot. This, yesterday we had a men's ministry retreat. And it was phenomenal. Great time. It was at Lake Williamson in Carlinville, Illinois. And uh, as I'm going there, there's a memory, because here's, here's one of the memories, is uh, as I left a retreat, I think it was two or three years ago, it was either the either kids had a retreat, they're teenagers, and I went there with my wife, Kathy, or either we had a retreat. Uh, I can't really remember that. Um, exactly who was there, but I do remember what happened after the retreat. It's at night, it's pitch black. When you drive to Carlinville, you get off on roads that are like B, B, D, D, A, A, F, F. You never know where you're going, and you're on these roads, and they're off the main highway, and it's very dark. So as we're leaving, it was during the fall, uh, my wife says, Tom, I would like to have some of those corn stalks that you could put around like your front door post that, you know, says the holidays, says Thanksgiving, says uh, those things. And uh, I said, okay. And she says, we, ran, we, we went past a bunch of cornfields. And I'm like, yeah. And so she started putting extreme oral pressure on me. <laughs> now, I'm trying to be nice. What she was using rhymes with the word bagging. So this extreme oral pressure, she said, there's a cornfield, there's a cornfield. Now it's pitch black. It's in the fall, it's cold. I don't give a rip about having corn stalks around my doorpost at the house, but my lovely bride does. <laughs> so we run over a, a train track. There's a little path, a little, looks like where a combine or something went down. So after extreme oral pressure of about three miles, I pull in that little path get out, open the trunk of my minivan, and start to cut off some of the corn, dried corn stalks and some of the fallen ones and shove them in the back of my minivan. Now, these are tall corn stalks. They fit in there, had them shoved in there, and all of a sudden, I see whirling lights. <laughs> I see the whirling lights, and I look at my wife like this. And I'm thinking I was a pastor just leading the retreat, and I'm stealing corn stalks. <laughs> so the guy gets out. He says, what are you guys doing here? I would have rather told him that we were parking. <laughs> I didn't get that opportunity. So I said, stealing corn stalks. <laughs> he says, that's what I thought. Now, the corn stalks were sitting out of the back end of my minivan. He says, okay. Don't take too many. And he drives off. All right? Now, in my world, that was justice. All right? Those corn stalks that I took, they were kind of on the floor. I made sure I took the crummiest of the corn stalks, pretty much. But I thought that was justice, and it made me feel good. There was another time where I actually got a ticket. It was a hill in Oakville, this hill that you go up, and at the top of the hills, there's a stop sign. So I went up and got to the point where your car almost stops, but crawled through it, and all of a sudden, I hear... Right, look out, and the guy said, did you stop the stop sign? I said, but I, no, I didn't run it, though, either. I crawled through it. <laughs> he says, well, you won't crawl through it next time, and that cost me 100 bucks. Now, there's this thing inside of you that wants 
justice. You believe in justice, someone's right to justice. All right? You believe in a family's right to justice. I wrote this down. You, you believe in a neighbor's right to justice. You believe in a business's right to justice. You believe in a worker's right to justice. You believe in a community's right to justice. You believe in a nation's right to justice. Uh, Aristotle wrote this. At his best, man is the noblest of all animals. Separated from law and justice, he is the worst. So justice is an important concept, right? If you hurt my family, if you trashed my house, if you destroyed something I had made, if you abused my hospitality and my patience, if you disrespected my presence, you assaulted my character, and you abused my generosity, I would deserve justice from you, correct? That's God. That's God. That's what we've all done to God. So it's just a simple question. If we believe that we deserve justice, and we do, then don't we believe that God deserves justice from all of us? Every one of us. We've trashed his creation. We've ignored his presence. We've hurt his creation, his children. All these things that I've mentioned in here. We've abused his hospitality. We've worn out our welcome or patience that should be. We've done these things over and over again. Now, this is why it's so critical to know Jesus because then you can understand God's justice. And he deserves justice, right? If you're, if you're saying right now, I don't think he deserves justice, then you're a hypocrite and you don't deserve it either. But if you believe you deserve justice, and I believe everybody does believe that, then you must believe that God deserves justice. And could you imagine if you were the only person that everybody had ripped? That's, that's God when you think about it. So knowing God's justice requires you to know Jesus. That's what uh, we're going to teach here today before we get into the main verse about Romans. Jesus said in John 14, 6 through 7, speaking to the apostles, he's speaking to the believers. So he makes this statement. He says, I am the way. This is the words of Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And then he makes this statement. He says, if you really know me, you will know the Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. So he makes this statement. Why did Jesus come? Because of the justice of God to reveal who God was. So Jesus enters the picture, and he says, if you want to know who God is, then you you, you know who I am. In other words, for us to understand God, a, a concept that would be impossible without him coming as a man to understand how he lived. Understand that? So that's what Jesus says. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen God. So therefore, we look closely at Jesus. At Oak Bridge, it's our, it's, it's our mission statement to make followers of Jesus, who in turn make followers of Jesus. When you leave this room, it says it's all about who? Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, you know the Creator. Okay. In John 14, 8 through 9, a little bit later, after Jesus had just said that, Philip said, Well, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Now, Jesus had just said, When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Here's what he said. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Now, here's some things. Jesus reveals the heart of the Father. He reveals what God's heart is about. Jesus reveals our relational standing with God, our Father. Jesus opens the door of truth to the will of our Father. Before I read this next story, that is a a story a lot of you Christians have heard, but I'm going to show you, I think, a more accurate context. Have you ever said, let me tell you about my dad to anybody? You guys ever... I mean, you say, hey, let me tell you about my dad. Your dad just passed. Can I t- tell my grandkids about my dad? Can I tell you about my dad? You ever said that? That's kind of what Jesus is doing here. See, he comes into the picture, and he says, let me, let me tell you about my dad. Let me tell you about the truth of how he is. Let me tell you about the truth of the relationship he wants to have with you. Let me tell you about how he sees you and how what he knows about you. So, Jesus tells this story. And the story is known as, known as the prodigal son. And I believe it's mislabeled. A prodigal means uh, behaving recklessly. So 
it's labeled that way. Most scriptures will have the story, then they'll have a little subtitle that says the prodigal son, or you've heard that story. But I believe that the name of the story should be once a father, always a father. Say that with me. Once a father, always a father. I think that the accurate story that he tells here is, you'll hear a story and you'll talk about a son, but the real story, if you look at it, is what Jesus is trying to explain to you is the father God. The story, if you look at the context, it's not about the wayward son, it's about the faithful father. He's trying to explain to you, this is God. So in this story, we are the son. All of us are the son. In this story, the father is God. And Jesus says, I'm revealing to you who he is. Now, you may have a view of God as some uh, white bearded dude with a lightning bolt that's ready to strike you down for everything you've done wrong. And I think that would be a ploy of Satan. That, Jesus says, that is not the father. That is not. So listen up with your ears. And listen to the Father. Luke 15, 11 through 24 is where we find this. Jesus continued. He said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. A little context here. Uh, the oldest son got the majority of the estate. The youngest son got the minority of the estate. The estate was never divided until the father had died. With me on this? So therefore, the son, the youngest son is basically saying, I could care less if you're dead. I really want my estate now. Now, some of you have been in families like that that are dysfunctional like that, where, you know, it's just a money grab at death. That was this kid telling the father. So Jesus is setting this story up. So this kid's not exactly one right now that have his, has his courtesy, his compassion, his love meter in line. All right. So verse 13. So not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So let me give you the picture, and I'm going to use it in the right way. He tells God to go pound salt. I don't care about you, nothing about you. Now, all of us have said that a time or two. We have. And some of you may be saying it, maybe, you know, I don't think about it. I don't care about God. And maybe the God that you don't care about is not the God that Jesus is trying to reveal to you. So he said, you know, I don't care about you, God, at all. And I'm going to go do what I want to do. And that's what this kid does. So after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. And he began to be in need. Verse 15. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. Now, Jesus is really making this story rough because this was a Jewish audience, and Jewish audiences would not even touch pigs, right, let alone feed them. And it gets worse. Listen to what he says. He's, he sent him out to feed, uh, feed the pigs. And in verse 16, Jesus says, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Meaning he was so low at such a bad spot, he wanted to eat the things that the pigs were eating the slop that they were eating, all the stuff that was in it. That's how bad he had gotten. So he had done some things that had brought him to a terrible spot. Have you ever done some things that brought you to a terrible spot? Can you just imagine God going, see? There you go. New is going to happen. Hey, you made your bed, now what? Is that, is that what we read? I want to see. When he came to his senses, verse 17, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I'm starving to death. The people of God don't have it too bad. So what he says, he says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. He says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me like one of your hired servants. Just make me just a slave. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Stop. Jesus is telling the story. The kid did everything that would alienate God, everything that was against his father. And Jesus tells the story, and I want you to pay attention. While the kid came back, he says, the father sees him. He's a long way off. So now you could say, what would the father say? Go away. 
you've blown it, if you walk closer, lightning will strike. Hell will freeze over. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, and he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. Now that's the father. I don't know what your sin is, but it has not impacted the love of God for you. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, and I love this. For the son of mine was dead, and now he's alive again. He was lost, and he's found. So they began to celebrate. You know what this is a story about? Once a father, always a father. Once a father, always a father. Maybe you've had a father that wasn't so good. But the father that we have, the father that Jesus reveals, he'll always be your father. Once a father, always a father. No matter where you've been, what you've thought, what you've done. It's hard to imagine. But this is Jesus telling us the true picture. So last week in Romans 7, 21 through 25, if you weren't here, you can catch back up online. But I had a rope and we were talking about tug of war. And I made the, the observation, I believe, that Paul uh, was a plus 10 Christian, meaning he got it. He loved God. He loved people by his life. And yet he said he struggled often with how he lived his life. So a plus 10 Christian isn't a perfect Christian. There's no such thing. This side of heaven, there'll be no perfect Christians. Outside of heaven, we'll all be perfect Christians. So he wrote in Romans 7, 21 through 25, I want to read this to you again. He says, so I find this law at work, although I want to do good, this is the words of Paul, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law at sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Then he says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, I, I, when I see clearly who I am, I realize I fall so short of, that's not my standards, but God's standards. I missed the mark. We all could identify with that last week, that spiritual tug of war. And yet people will come to me and will say, so I've botched it. God will never use me again. My marriage can never be healed. My relationships can never be restored. I can never have a better self-esteem. And the answer is, that is so not our father. That is so minimizing his power. That is so minimizing his love and concern and compassion and completion for you. That's why this statement that jumps in Romans 8, first statement is so huge, it's so colossal. Because we believe that we deserve condemnation because of what we've done somehow. Yet, the one that could give it, the one who should have justice, cosmic justice, because we've all sinned against him. We've all done him wrong. Here's what Paul says right after he says that. Who delivers me, Jesus Christ our Lord, then in Romans 8, 1 through 4. And this is the statement we're at. This is why this is so colossal. And in fact, um, after I say the word in Christ Jesus, I believe that there's cosmic celebrations of all the angels in heaven and those that have gone before us when a person accepts Jesus Christ because they see the enormity of it. They know their sins taken away. They know the righteousness of God is transferred onto them. They know that they have heaven, all heaven. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more weeping. All good things in front of them, and I think they celebrate that. So just as a way, just of, uh, I've, never had, I've never asked you to do this yet, but I'm gonna say, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is what Paul says, based on what about Jesus. Then after I read this verse first, which is what we're gonna talk about for a moment, right after I say Christ Jesus, I want you to stand and give a standing ovation and a clap for the truth of that word, almost as if this, almost as if we had a family member that won an award. What do families do when somebody does something good? They celebrate, don't they? 
That's why baptism should be celebrations. I'm so proud of you guys that you guys gave a standing ovation to their testimonies, not just for the confession of faith, but what God has done through them. So I'm going to read this, and then let's go crazy just for a minute. We'll get back to this. Ready? Therefore, here's Paul. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's right. None. There is none. 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 For you, for me, there is none because of Jesus. None. Thank you. You can take a seat. That is a picture of heaven when you take a step towards Jesus, when you accept Christ. That is what happens. There is no condemnation. This is the, the, the theological word would be this, for those who are in Christ Jesus, meaning positionally, you are now in Christ. There's no condemnation. If you're in Christ, you've accepted Christ, you've believed Christ, God has taken you positionally, and he said, I move you into the category of grace. You are in Christ. No condemnation, none. Now, with that said, I want to make three statements as I move this through this quickly. Condemnation is not the same thing as conviction. You should experience in your walk with Christ conviction. Conviction is hopeful. Conviction says to yourself uh, something specifically that you're convicted for. It means you can work on that, you can change on that. Conviction is hopeful. Condemnation is general. You're generally condemned and it's hopeless. If you're condemned, you know, a, a guy that has the death sentence, he's what? Condemned. Condemned to what? Death. There's no hope, but conviction is, is a positive thing. So if you're convicted about something, don't, don't confuse it with condemnation. It's, it's a work of the Holy Spirit to say, yeah, we can fix this. We can move past this. We can go past this. Every time I'm convicted, it never really feels good, but mentally I've learned to say, thank you, God. Thank you. The second thing is you should, you're going to feel you're going to experience consequences. You're going to experience those things. But those consequences are not a result of God condemning. They're a result of your sin. What you sow, we reap. God can overcome that, move through that, move past that, get you by that. But he did not send that. And the third thing you'll feel, you'll feel correction. You should feel that that there's a better way, there's, there's a, a more accurate thing. In fact, some of you maybe for the first time today are thinking, you know what? I've misjudged God. I need to know Jesus more, and I know enough about him now to know that he reveals the Father, and the Father loves me. And the correction you need to make is, you need to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and he died for you. And he takes his righteousness, and he gives it to you. And he takes your sin, and he takes it, and he buried it at the cross. But condemnation, no. Conviction, yes. Consequences, yes. Correction, yes. Condemnation, no. The Christ follower, the Christian, therefore there is no condemnation. You should not feel condemnation. And if you do, it's one of three things that is happening. One of three. Number one, it's Satan. There's a spiritual battle. And we could talk about this, I guess, for the next few weeks. I'm not going to go into it right now. But Satan wants you to feel condemned. He is known as the accuser. In Revelation chapter 12, verses 10, he is the accuser of the brethren. That's us. He wants to make you feel condemned because a condemned person feels hopeless. A hopeless Christian, a hopeless Christian is not worth much in their impact for Christ. See, when you, become, when you become where you believe that you're just condemning, you're not worth anything, then, then, then really you quit trying to do anything. And that's not what God wants. That's what Satan wants. Satan wants to accuse you. We all have things we've done. We all have things we will do. But there is a God who says there is no condemnation for you because you are what? In Christ. There are consequences, yes. There's conviction, yes. And there's correction. But all because I love you. And don't we do that with our children? Don't you hope that, haven't I taught you better than that? Don't you hope there's some conviction? Then don't you say, well, you know, I, I know you did that, you should have, but here's the consequence. And then don't you try and correct it? All right. 
So one is Satan. Second thing is you. You make yourself feel condemned. Can I, I'm going to say this as kindly as I can. Do you put yourself as a judge above Jesus? Because if he doesn't condemn you, what right do you have? Honestly, what right do we have to condemn ourselves if Jesus doesn't? Are we putting ourselves above him? I read this and thought this was just awesome. Condemnation happens when I focus on me. Worship happens when I focus on Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Condemnation happens when I focus on me and worship happens when I focus on Jesus. So you, quit condemning yourself. You can correct yourself. You can move past it. You can fall at the mercy of God. But stop with the condemnation. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help your family. It doesn't help our community. It certainly doesn't help our nation. And just as a quick thing right now, that's why this cancel culture is straight from the pit of hell. A better word for cancel culture is condemnation culture. And I know that's not in my Savior. And I know that's the one that's against him. Let's not participate in that. And the third thing is, is there's other people that make you feel condemned. It might have been an angry parent. I don't know. A hurt parent. It might be a job, a teacher, a sibling. I don't know who it is. But I'm going to ask that it's not you today. Listen, Christian, listen to me. Listen, family. I'm going to ask that if you've been condemning your spouse, stop. You've been condemning your kids. Stop. If you've been condemning a parent or a friend, stop. Stop. You can, it's fine to, to work on correction. It's fine to talk about the situation. But condemnation... That's not where we want to land. John 3, 16, 17. Once a father, now you say once a father. This is our God, once a father, always a father. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, let's restate it. Let's read this one together. And instead of world, let's say me. For God so loved me that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Stop. For God so loves me that he gave us Jesus that if we believe in him we shall not perish but shall have eternal life. That's the most popular verse in the entire canon of scripture. Entire Bible. And yet the second verse is equally as powerful that follows that but it's rarely ever read. You go to the reflection room, you read John 3, 16, and you'll also read 3, 17. Verse 17. For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Isn't that amazing? He didn't see Je send Jesus to condemn us. He sent him to save us. He's our only hope. And then in John 3, 18, if we read one more, which you very rarely ever get to this, it says this. Whoever believes in him... You're in Christ. Whoever's in Christ, whoever believes in him, is not condemned. But whoever does not stand, con but whoever does not believe, stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God, the one and only Son. In other words, we automatically know we're condemned by our own action. But God says, in me, in Christ, you are not condemned anymore. That is the beauty of accepting Jesus. Positionally, you take a step from knowing that you're in condemnation to now, therefore, there is no condemnation through the mighty power and grace of Jesus Christ. So the question that I have for you today is, would you make that step? Would you say in your heart and in your mind, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord. I believe that he loves me. I believe that he reveals the true heart of the Father. And the true heart of the Father is once a father, always a father. He wants you back with him because he is a perfect, loving father. And you are his treasured child. You are his treasured daughter. You are his treasured son. No matter what your past has been, no matter how prodigal or wayward you've been, God loves you, and the truth and the proof of that is Jesus. We have a shirt we wear around here that says for, and simply if you see that, what that means is, is God is for you, and the proof of that is Jesus Christ. 
Nobody sacrifices their son. Nobody pulls their son from the highest position in heaven to the lowest position on earth unless that person that they're dying for is worthy in the eyes of the beholder. And you are worthy, made worthy by the blood, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul, who says, I am the chief of all sinners, who can save me from this spiritual battle that I find myself in. And then he makes the statement, for there is no condemnation, he's speaking to Romans, for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That is the privilege, that is the beauty, that is the the truth of who you are and who Jesus has made you. So I just want to invite some of you today. I want you to bow your heads. I'm going to invite some of you. If it's you that needs to make a decision for Jesus, and you know it's right. He can redeem you. He can restore you. He brings hope into your world. He takes your sin. If that's you, then it's just a simple thing. You confess it and you believe it, but I'm going to ask you right now with all heads bowed, nobody looking, just to raise your hand. Say, I, I trust you, Jesus. I want you to be my, my savior. Yeah, there's some there. Keep them coming up. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you've never confessed it, I'm talking about people that have never confessed it. Get your hand up. For the first time, you're confessing Christ as your savior. You say, I, I want to be my Lord. You can put your hand down. Now, if you understand what happened was at that moment when you confessed that and believed that in your heart because you now know who God is through Jesus Christ, I want you to understand it says all heaven rejoices. There was a massive celebration. Jesus said, yes, what I did pay for their debt. What I did restored them back to you. And the father said, thank you. And he runs towards you now. And he says, you are saved by the blood of my son, Jesus Christ. For all eternity, I will be your good heavenly father. Because once a father, always a father. Now family celebrates when people make a good decision. So I know there were a few of you that raised your hand. And now I'm going to ask you if you could just stand up right now. You raise your hand, stand up. If you had your hand up, just, and if you didn't stand up, now's your time to stand up. Now listen up. Listen up. There's been a real transaction that went on in the spiritual realm that all of us have experienced that accepted Christ. And God says, I'm, I've always been for you. I just want you to acknowledge me. There's a holy justice that you can avoid through my son Jesus. And it's trust in him. Not your works, it's trust in him. And when you make that decision, when you pull down the walls of pride, when you pull down the walls of ignorance that now you know and now you see, God says the most miraculous thing happened. I forgave you. Because once a father, always a father. Now something else happened that I'm going to ask you to do right after I say, uh, let's do this. Like we said, all heaven rejoiced. There was a, I can't hear it, but in my mind's eye, I can imagine a million angels right now singing your names. I can imagine God saying, I formed her, I formed him before they're in their mother's womb. I used the mom and dad's DNA, but I knew who they are. They're mine, they're my children, and I love them. And I've, I've driven this moment and cannot wait for it. So then all heaven erupted. All heaven erupted. Let's erupt with applause to you. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Stand up. Stay standing as we pray. Father, we just thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he's revealed to us who you are, Father. We thank you for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We thank you that it's not a salvation of works, but it's a salvation of faith. We thank you that, Father, it's not a religion of rules. It's a relationship. God, I praise you for these people that made this decision and those that have gone before. And those that are that you're working on just moving towards that decision. I pray that that hastens, that the time comes when they're ready that they make that decision. Father, we love you. Have the song be our 
just anthem to you as we get ready to leave. It's in your son's name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen.
know God makes two promises when you trust in Christ. One of them is not that on this side of heaven you'll be made perfect. His promise is you'll be made new. This is our former new heart. We have many new firsts, many second chances, many third chances, but I'm making you new. That's what he's doing with all of us. Then when we die, he makes a promise. Now I'll make you perfect as I am perfect. Where's the, where's the loss in this? A new step, a new person, a new chance, a new hope, a new faith, a new joy, a new peace, a new compassion, a new love, a new forgiveness, this side of heaven. And then when we step before God, he says, I'll make you perfect as I am perfect. You're my treasured child. You're my treasured daughter. You're my treasured son. If you made that decision today, uh, I can't give you heaven, but I give you a free t-shirt if you go into the... Uh, you go into the connect room right there and tell them, look, I made a decision for Christ. And if you've got any questions, you're welcome to ask them. And if not, then just say, look, give me my free T-shirt. That's what I got. I got heaven and I get this day, so we'd love to have you. If you're a guest, we'd love to see you come in to uh, get an information packet from the information center. It tells you all about our church. And if you take a coupon that's in there and go into the same room, the connect room right outside this door, they'll give you a free T-shirt for you and everybody that's with you today if we just take just a, a record of your visit. That said, Romans now starts talking about the family of God. Talks about how we get into it, who we really are, how we need Jesus. And so for the next length of time, (laughs) we're going to spend some time learning to love God by loving Jesus. Amen? Have a good week. Thanks for coming.